you are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Feast Day Quick Take on the Feast of St. John of the Cross with a tribute to a good friend of his and mine whose feast day I missed last month. It's always encouraging to find in the lives of the saints tendencies that have a flavor of familiarity and comfort, habits that are approachable to common everyday folks like ourselves. We tend to think that the lives of holy men and women bear no resemblance to our own. How could they possibly? But you'd be surprised at how they do, especially in that so many of the saints cherished particular friendships throughout their lives. Though some saints were called to solitary lives, most were not, and the examples of holy friendships amongst them could fill a book. It's a fact that holy feathers flock together. St. Francis Xavier and St. Ignatius of Loyola, for example, were roommates in college and loyal friends. Then there's the holy friendship of St. Francis and St. Clair of Assisi. St. Charles Borromeo and St. Philip Neri were friends. St. Dominic counted both St. Francis of Assisi and St. Simon de Montfort as friends. St. Thomas Aquinas befriended King St. Louis of France. And today's saint, John of the Cross, is seldom considered without also remembering his great friend and ally, St. Teresa of Avila. Except for the bond of faith and virtue, two more unlikely people could not have been paired. St. Teresa of Avila, born in 1515, was 27 years older than St. John. She was the daughter of a noble family and grew up in a home of, if not luxury, they were never in want. He was the son of an impoverished family and was only able to further his education due to the charity and compassion of others. St. Teresa was gregarious and quick-witted, a born leader. St. John tended more towards studious reserve and a deep spirituality. What bound them together in friendship was a shared desire to reform the Carmelite order next to their great love of God. St. John of the Cross, born Juan de Alvarez, began his studies for the priesthood in the newly formed Order of the Jesuits, but made his first profession with the Carmelites in 1564 and was ordained a Carmelite in 1567. But finding the laxity of the order a hindrance to his spiritual development, he was seriously considering joining the Carthusians, which were well known to have a stricter rule, when he ran into St. Teresa of Avila, and it was a match made in heaven, probably literally. St. Teresa was in the process of opening her second Reformed Carmelite convent in Medina, Spain, when St. John came along. She convinced him to join her in restoring the Carmelite order, for both men and women, and by 1568 he had left his monastery in Salamanca to found the first new Carmelite friary, following St. Teresa's principles of Reformation. And this endeavor was no picnic. The very fact of reforming anything— requires the admission that the thing needs reforming, that it is in fact flawed or broken, that the status quo is subpar. When the vast majority are enjoying the status quo, however, especially when it is an easy and comfortable status quo, the reformers are bound to be pretty unpopular. Such was the case with St. Teresa and St. John. Both saints were made to suffer immensely for their efforts. St. John was actually kidnapped by members of his own order, imprisoned for nine months, and regularly beaten. But the two holy friends, relying upon one another for prayers, encouragement, and advice, finally succeeded with the help of God in creating a new branch of the Carmelite order known as the Order of the Discalced, or Barefoot, Carmelites. Together, they established more than 20 discalced Carmelite convents and monasteries. By the time of the first provincial chapter at Alcala in 1581, there were 22 houses and some 300 friars and 200 nuns. The following year, St. John heard about the death of St. Teresa while he was at his monastery in Granada, a loss he was to mourn for the next nine years until his own death in 1591. 
Interestingly, St. Teresa died just as Europe was making the switch from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar, so the precise date of her death has been confused, as the change required the deletion of the dates between October 5th and October 14th. Regardless of this, her feast has been fixed on the date of October 15th in the liturgical calendar. St. Teresa's last words were, quote, My Lord, it is time to move on. Well then. May your will be done. O oh, my Lord and my spouse, the hour that I have longed for has come. It is time to meet one another. She was buried at the convent of the Annunciation in Alba de Tormes, Spain. Nine months afterward, her body was found to be incorrupt, though her clothing had rotted due to the damp. Four years later, her relics were still incorrupt, and on her incorrupt heart could plainly be seen the wound of love she described having been caused by the pierce of a divine arrow. St. Teresa of Avila was canonized by Pope Gregory XV in 1622, 40 years after her death. Besides her reformation of the Carmelite order, St. Teresa is well known for her writings on the contemplative life, in particular the interior castle. And for the wit and wisdom she shared in numerous correspondences, she is recognized as one of the great mystics of the Church. She is the patroness of Spain, of all religious orders, of Catholic writers, of people with headaches, and of people ridiculed because of their piety. St. John of the Cross was canonized by Benedict Thirteenth in 1726. He was declared a doctor of the Church by Pope Pius XI in 1926. He is considered one of the foremost Spanish poets. His complete poems, most of them written between 1578 and his death in 1591, total up to 2,500 verses. His two most famous works being The Spiritual Candle and The Dark Night of the Soul. As a mystic, one who communes with the divine, he is equal to his good friend and mentor, St. Teresa of Avila, and is commonly known as the mystical doctor. He is the patron saint of the contemplative life and of mystical theology. It seems that both of these saints would also be obvious helpers in times of spiritual doldrums or when we are tempted to despair. Consider St. John's discouragement when monks from his own abbey imprisoned him and beat him, though he knew he was doing the will of God in reforming the order. And St. Teresa is known to have experienced a 20-year period of spiritual dryness, but persevered steadfastly in prayer and good works, uncomplaining and cheerful as ever, and so received the fruit of all those years as a cross that benefited her eternally. I can't help but think as well that these two also offer us the perfect example of how to conduct ourselves in friendships, and chiefly the prospect of choosing good friends. I'm sure we can depend on their patronage in finding and being good friends ourselves, and in helping our children in this most important life skill. St. John Bosco stated this very clearly, quote, Fly from bad companions as from the bite of a poisonous snake. If you keep good companions, I can assure you that you will one day rejoice with the Blessed Mother in heaven, whereas if you keep with those who are bad, you will become bad yourself and will be in danger of losing your soul. And now, if you don't mind, I'd like to scroll through the Rolodex of Saint Quotes as the words of the saints speak for themselves. In his book, The Friendship of the Saints, Father Aloysius Roche says of Saint John of the Cross and Saint Teresa of Avila, Quote, Indeed, it seems to have been only necessary for people to come in contact with these saints to love them. St. Teresa did not take her friends for granted. In speaking of her friendship with St. John of the Cross, she once said, What a wonderful thing it is for two souls to understand each other, for they neither lack something to say nor grow tired. She also said, what a great favor God does for those whom he places in the company of good people. Now, we can't speak of our St. Teresa without including her famous quote, From silly devotions and sour-faced saints, good Lord deliver us, end quote. St. Teresa was as spiritual and contemplative as they come, and suffered as many or more crosses and setbacks than most, but she made it a rule to be light-hearted, it's easy to see how she gathered friends so easily. 
She once wrote to one of the sisters of the order, What would become of us if each of us hid all the little wits she possessed? No one has too much. Let each one produce whatever she has in her with all humility in order to cheer up others. End quote. In this same vein, her correspondences with St. John prove the natural and humorous bond between them. She is known to have teasingly called him, on account of his short stature, a half a friar, but she also nicknamed him Seneca due to his great wisdom. St. John of the Cross was no sour-faced saint, or he would never have been so dear to St. Teresa. The mystical doctor once wrote, The soul of one who serves God always swims in joy, always keeps holidays, and is always in the mood for singing. End quote. The nuns at St. Teresa's convent, however, didn't know this about St. John when he was first appointed to be the confessor at one of the newly reformed convents, and they were afraid to confess to St. John and his priests because they had a reputation of being very strict. When the nuns, therefore, went into the confessional, they would often ask the priest if he were discalced or barefoot. St. John was not offended and only hesitated a moment before simply pulling his habit over his bare feet and answering, Calced. There is nothing on this earth more to be prized than true friendship, so said St. Thomas Aquinas. But what, we might ask, is a true friendship? Cicero defined it thus, Friendship is agreement with kindliness and affection about things human and divine. End quote. So a good friend shares important human likes and dislikes, but also shares our spiritual outlook, our Catholic faith. Love everyone with a strenuous love based on charity, says St. Francis de Sales, but form friendships only with those who can share virtuous things with you. The greater the virtues you share and exchange with others, the more perfect your friendship will be. Which explains the beautiful and enduring friendships among so many of the saints. The cure to ours once said, quote, When the heart is pure, it cannot help loving because it has rediscovered the source of love, which is God. End quote. Far from diminishing human friendships, the supernatural bond between the saints elevated them. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton joined St. John Bosco in warning us, If I had to advise parents, I would tell them to take great care about the people with whom their children associate. Much harm may result from bad company, and we are inclined by nature to follow what is worse than what is better. End quote. This good counsel applies to more than just our children, of course. G. K. Chesterton gives us a little hint to help us know the good from the bad. In prosperity, he says, our friends know us. In adversity, we know our friends. In the City of God, St. Augustine tells us, What gives us consolation in this human society, filled as it is with errors and troubles, if not the sincere loyalty and mutual love of true and good friends? And Padre Pio sums up the chief goal of true friendship. Let us become saints, he said, so that after having been together upon earth, we may be together in heaven. End quote. Regarding our friends already in heaven, St. Thomas explains, The greater the charity of the saints in their heavenly home, the more they intercede for those of us who are still on the journey, and the more they can help us by their prayers. The more we are united with God, the more effective those prayers are. This is in accordance with divine order, which makes higher things react upon lower things, like the brightness of the sun filling the atmosphere. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. And one last word of sincere gratitude for the intercession of our heavenly friends on this Thanksgiving Day in America. And for all the church militant friends of the Catholic Family Podcast, for your support, your comments, and your prayers, we all humbly thank you. And by the way, George, this one's for you. <laughs>